I'm delighted to introduce not one but two speakers today. Shazad Bashir is the Aga Khan Professor of Islamic Humanities and Professor of History at Brown University. He specializes in the intellectual and social history of Iran and Central and South Asia from the late medieval period to the present. His major book project currently is a digital monograph titled Islamic Pasts and Futures, Horizons of Time, that consists of a series of interpretive essays on conceptual issues pertaining to the conjunction between Islam and history. He's published widely on the intellectual and social histories of the societies of Iran and Central and South Asia between the 14th century and the present. These include books and scholarly articles on Sufism and Shiism, messianic movements originating in Islamic contexts, and modern trans transformations of Islamic societies. He has co-edited a book titled Under the Drones, Modern Lives in the Afghanistan-Pakistan Borderlands. He also has the relatively rare gift for generating creative titles for his scholarly work. For example, an article published in 2013 is titled The World as a Hat, Symbolism and Materiality in Safavid, Iran. In dialogue with him today is our own Jamal Elias, who is the Walter Annenberg Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Religious Studies at Penn. He teaches courses on Islamic thought, culture, and history with a focus on Sufism, Islam, and modernity, as well as visual and material culture in the Middle East and South Asia. He has been involved in a scholarly initiative with the American Council of Learned Societies aimed at diversifying the professoriate in the American Academy. He's also an ace photographer, and among his several works is a wonderful book on wings of diesel truck, on wings of diesel, trucks, identity, and culture in Pakistan. Professor Bashir. So first of all, thank you very much, um, Professor Srinivasan, for that very generous introduction, and also a general thank you to all the different sponsors um, of the series and of events, and to all of you for being here. Um, this, I have been um, at Penn a number of different times, and it's always a great pleasure. So um, this, this kind of continues a series as far as I'm concerned, and I look forward to your comments as well as uh, in conversation with Professor Elias um, in this event. Um, so <clears throat> when I first got the invitation with respect to this, um, this year's topic of kinship, um, it struck an immediate chord for, uh, with me because I have been trying to think about questions of temporality and time, generally speaking, for a number of years. And, <clears throat> and the question of kinship is intimately tied to the um, narration of time. Um, so, uh, so what I, uh, I'm trying to do is t uh, today was is to lay out some of the things that have occurred to me as being especially significant for thinking about <clears throat> um, time and kinship, um, and kinship and history together. And uh, in, in my own work, this has happened in the context of a general consideration of the production of time. Um, so I'm looking, really looking forward to input from you, people who have been thinking about kinship in much broader terms and not, not just with respect to uh, temporality, to get feedback and um, a kind of engagement on that level. So first, just a, some uh, general um, comments with respect to the framing of what I will talk about. Um, so my concern has been the question of temporality, by which I mean how time is produced um, as past, future, present, and so on and so forth in narratives and performance. So the key issue for me is to think of time as a human product that is constantly being invented and reinvented um, um, over the in terms of in, that we can see signatured in various types of materials that we can examine. <clears throat> So within that context, one of the major areas, of course, is the production of history. And so rather than thinking of history um, as a representation, uh, rather than thinking about the content of what the historians are saying or what chronicles are saying about the past, I'm interested in how exactly do they imagine what the past was and how things are framed and history is narrated, history is created and so on. This, uh, related to that is the question of historiography and um, 
but for, for my purposes, I'm trying to think of historiography away from the way it has been often been framed, certainly for Islamic materials as being um, texts that are official chronicles and so forth. I'm interested in the production of time uh, in all different formats, um, so taking a very broad view of historiography as the past uh, writ large. But then also looking at things like epic, um, at architecture, etc. Um, so in a way, what it ends up being, the project ends up being, is to look at all kinds of material data that I can have within which time is an element, and then try to think about how can we, how can we complicate the picture. Now, within this context, then, genealogy comes in as, um, as a, a type of valorized temporality. Um, and what I mean by and, and genealogy, meaning uh, essentially kind of narration of kinship um, in a way. Um, and so materials that are concerned with the Islamic past are completely imbued with genealogical signatures um, in the form of notions of, of dynasties, of lineages of various sorts, um, uh, whether based upon ideas, practices, and so on and so forth. So in a way, it is something that is completely seeps through all the material. And the, the question of genealogy, both evocated directly in the sense of uh, dynastics being talked about or families being discussed, and also um, in terms of by implication, the idea of progression of ideas within certain lineages and so on and so forth. So kinship um, in the genealogical form is then something that undergirds um, almost all the material that, that, um, that I have been looking at. Now, what, uh, so the, the main issue that I want to pick up on this today is that in the production of modern historiography, in modern narrations of the Islamic past at least, uh, there is a way in which genealogies have been replicated. That is to say that the genealogical imagination that is present in the sources has actually formed the frames within which we come to have come to narrate um, the, uh, the past of these societies as well. Uh, so this is very much the case with respect to the fact that if we look at periodization of Islamic history, it is based upon um, genealogy. So we say, for example, for the early modern period, um, uh, Mughal history, Ottoman history, Safavid history, in all of those three cases, these are dynasties <clears throat> that have come to represent um, the, the, the very period within which this is happening. And the same is true outside of political matters in terms of, we think of Sufi lineages or lineage, lineages of... Um, scholars of various types, et cetera. So uh, in legal schools, et cetera, where the names of the schools um, and of uh, um, the intellectual lineages actually form the frames within which we actually narrate um, the, the past as well. Right? So there's a kind of interesting slippage <clears throat> in, in terms of our accepting these categories uh, from the past into the narration of the present. So what I'm interested in is to try to problematize um, this, um, all of these elements in various ways. Um, now, one of the things about is uh, that in terms of our own narration of the past, we pres the general presumption is that when we, that the societies we're talking about were heavily invested in genealogy. So um, the idea that um, authority, for example, passes from father to son within a political dynasty. So our presumption generally is that this was something that was ineluctable for the people who actually lived these lives. Um, there was something naturalized about thinking that authority must pass between generations in, in this particular way. <clears throat> and in that way, our presumption is that the narrative structures that we see in the narration of history are also where the real world um, within which these um, uh, these texts were produced. There's a general a kind of a correlation or a, a conflation between the narrative and the real uh, in the way, um, positivistically, when we read these kinds of sources. I'll give some more details so this will become clearer hopefully later. <clears throat> now, when we look at genealogies, um, there is a, we actually presume that we don't buy into the logic of genealogy, um, but we see the genealogy as um, a kind of uh, as an object that is waiting for our own deconstruction, that we can disaggregate it and interpret it based upon genealogical rhetoric. We can make claims about what was important, what was not important for, the, for these uh, societies. So our uh, investment in genealogy is very much keyed to 
the claims of genealogy that are in the text, but we are divested from the truths, but we presume that the people that we are reading were heavily invested in the truth of genealogical uh, transmission. So, so for my purposes, I think both of those things need further discussion and can be unpacked. <clears throat> Now, so for, for the first part, for the narration of the genealogically oriented text that we can read, one of the critical things is that genealogy is always rhetoric. It's not actually necessarily social reality, and I'll give you some examples to where this becomes um, very evident. <clears throat> and then we must take this as rhetoric that is being produced in highly contested circumstances. So to try to break away from thinking about genealogy as social reality to genealogy is rhetoric in context, in, in contest. Um, and then on our part, in terms of what we do with these genealogies, I want to complicate and to see and to pay attention to the fact that when we accept genealogies as frames for our own narrations, those produce automatic limitations that allow certain types of writing of certain types of histories and include and exclude other types. So I want to complicate things on, on uh, both sides. And in, within this, my interest is not to try to escape kinship and genealogy, and there is no escape because the material is completely imbued with it, but actually dive into it to actually try to particularize what exactly is meant by genealogy and kinship in these types of material and to try to, to figure out all the diverse um, actions and diverse types of investments that are going on. So what I'm going to do here then is to, to exemplify this is to um, do uh, present some examples based upon certain axes of analysis. Um, so on the question of genealogy actually acting as structure for narrating sp space-time, I will focus on South Asia and I will give you examples, one of the question of dynasty and another of a Sufi chain of religious authority, the Silsila, <clears throat> which is, both of these are quite significant. This, the, and the claim is not that these two things are exceptional, there are other ways, other types of examples one could bring in. But these are certainly very important for early modern South Asian history, um, and I want to use them to exemplify uh, larger questions. So one of the key things that I will go through as, as I um, talk through this is, is to emphasize that, that kinship it does not have a single logic. There are actually immense diversity of, of logics of kinship and genealogy once we start paying attention to the particularities of the material. So even though genealogy as an umbrella term we can understand as being significant, once we start looking into it, the thing starts to look, uh, kind of break down in interesting, uh, interesting ways. And then also to, to then, it is by diversifying it and by also focusing on it, we can also then look at uh, narrations and temporalities that we do find also in the materials that actually escape kinship, that are constructed precisely against kinship. And by combining the two, there are possibilities of other types of narrating the past available to us um, than, than what has been happening so far. Um, okay, so uh, I will um, just go into some examples then. So first is the question of dynasty. <clears throat> so what I want to uh, suggest is that dynasty is a way of uh, narrating space-time. Um, so it is completely pervasive in the narration of Islamic past. So, uh, so what you have is a genealogical table, and this was a book published in, uh, in the late 19th century about Islamic history and, and Islamic chronologies in which <clears throat> um, the, the, the history of Islam is presented in these chronologies. Um, so, and one of the key things is the title of the book is uh, the Muhammadan dynasties. Um, and this, even though certainly the writing of Islamic history has changed a lot, but the overall framework actually remains very much the same. But the, what I mean by the fact that dynasty is a, is a container of space-time is in the sense that when we look at this kind of chart, what, what we have is on the... Um, okay, this is, apologies, this stopped working, but on the... On the y-axis, we have a homogeneous time, basically giving time in from the year zero until all the way uh, to the present in which this is being written. And on top, on the x-axis, they give spaces, uh, Middle East, South Asia, and so on and so forth, right? So the x and y-axis are space and time. And, and, and those are homogenized 
kind of generalized descriptions of, of what those two things are. But what fills the homogenized time and space are the dynastic frames. So all the squiggly lines that we see in the middle is just showing what dynasty came to power, when and, when it, and where, and so on and so forth. Right? So in that way, dynasty, <clears throat> the notion of a dynasty comes to form this umbrella, uh, a space-time kind of um, umbrella for, um, for the narration of, um, um, uh, of, of, of time. And it produces the notion of periodization that still is very much uh, there with us, with us uh, to the present. Um, now, the key issue for me is that the sources for making this kind of a chart are all actually political rhetoric with respect to the dynastic claims that are being made for these, um, these types of um, entities, these types of space-time. Right? So they are, these are actually... They are not actually representing reality. They're actually making claims for, of authority of various types. Um, <clears throat> and, but what ends up happening is that um, by adopting those, those claims as taxonomic representation, we are kind of importing certain types of rhetoric as representation of uh, reality. Okay. Uh, And what that does, one of the things that it does is that um, because the dynasties are, are all patrilineal, uh, in, the, in this case there are some matrilineal ones here and there, but for the most part it's, 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 uh, they are patrilineal, it produces a view of history that is fundamentally tied to, to the male elite. Right? So and this is an obvious point that I'm not saying anything new, but what I want to say is that by framing things in dynasties, we are already tied to a certain versions of patrilineal history um, that then produces certain types of limitations. Now, the option out of this, um, for, for my purposes, um, is to then go into seeing some of what this, how this rhetoric actually works and try to like um, unearth it or dig it up from within. Uh, so um, I hope this is visible, um, at least to some degree from where, where we are sitting. Now, so this is a painting uh, that is produced somewhere between, it, it, is, it has various types of modifications between the year 1600 and 1627 in the Mughal court in India. Um, at the center of this painting is the king uh, Jahangir, uh, a Mughal emperor, um, who is uh, sitting in the, in the, in the, in the central um, part with holding a bird. And around him, on both sides, are other roundels in which are his various sons, who are his inheritors. And then on the bottom of it, uh, we have his ancestors, especially um, the, the son of Tamerlane Miran Shah, from whom the Mughals actually uh, correlated their authority to the past. So this is a very standardized type of uh, representation of genealogy in a way one could say almost like a classical royal genealogy looks something like this, with the king is center, central, and then <clears throat> you ha we have both the past the past authority, and then also the present, which is the king, and then the future in terms of who the sons are and how they're placed in, in around them. So, um, the, so we might think, okay, well, here is a representation of, of um, what Mughal reality may be like in terms of uh, political ideology and political thought and so on and so forth. Um, okay, the next, please. But the key issue with respect to this genealogy is that there is someone very, very important who is missing. Uh, who is the next actor, next emperor? So this, paint, this page is painting the last modification is at a time when one of the sons of uh, Jahangir had actually rebelled against him. And so he was written out of this genealogy. Uh, and that is the son, Shah Jahan, who, who we see on the other side, who eventually does become Jahangir's successor. Right? So in a way, this is, uh, so here we can see the question of rhetoric. What Jahangir's court is producing this genealogy specifically to actually exclude the one person who does become his successor. So this is, uh, and here, um, so, so the, the interesting th thing for me is that the most important aspect about this painting is not what it is showing, but what is actually not showing, right? Um, <clears throat> because of the internal contention. So what this tells us actually is about the specific political circumstances within which the genealogy is, is produced. Um, 
the overall significance of genealogy certainly we can get, but the, the, the important information that we can get from genealogy has to do with something that is actually missing um, from, from the painting. So by this kind of observation, um, which I'm here doing in, in pictorial form, but we can also do it in narrative and textual materials as well, <clears throat> there's a way in which we can turn these seemingly inert genealogies into historical data, and it actually uh, starts to, the whole notion starts to devolve in certain ways. <clears throat> um, now, um, go to the next. So here is another painting um, that is produced in 1650, so about uh, between 50 and, 30 year, uh, 50 and 20 years after the first one. So this is again showing uh, a Mughal genealogy. This is produced in the period of Shah Jahan himself, right? the one who becomes the king who is missing from the first painting. And what we see here is in the, uh, a different type of representation of, of the human figures in terms of the sizes. Center is here is Timur, Tamerlane, the, the progenitor of, um, of the dynasty. And then what the, there are four people sitting uh, around him who are the first Mughal emperors, Babur, Humayun, Akbar, and Jahangir. So we have Jahangir here um, sitting on the, in the right um, corner uh, at the bottom. Shah Jahan himself is not here. Uh, and, and here the past is weighted more heavily than the present um, because Timur is the, 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 most, the, the biggest figure here. But the interesting thing in this painting is actually uh, two of the figures. Next, please. Uh, one is, uh, no, please back. But just, yeah, uh, here. So the two things that, that are highlighted on, on this slide. Um, <clears throat> So one of the, the major issues here is that the person who is represented as uh, Timur is actually um, Shah Jahan himself. One of his big conceits was that he was the second Timur. Right? So in a way, it is both the past and the present that is being represented. And he is the one who is the exact copy of Timur who actually transcends his own ancestors while being replicated through it. So we can correlate this with other types of political rhetoric that, that comes out of Shah Jahan's court. And the other figure who stands on the right side, um, on the, sorry, on the left side, um, which is highlighted, is a man dressed in white who is offering something to Shah Jahan. And that is the poet Saadi, <clears throat> a great um, Persian moralist and poet who really represents um, kind of the eternal um, ethics um, of how kings are supposed to behave and how society is to be run. Right? So in a way... Um, the relationship in the painting is actually between the eternal truth and the eternal ways of being a king, uh, kind of princess, uh, um, advice for princesses type of literature, and with Shah Jahan um, disguised as Timur. And the other figures are kind of supplanted um, underneath it. Now, there, so my main point in showing the two in contrast is just to show how completely different types of things that are happening are being done with the production of genealogy between the first and the, and the second painting. Uh, and so next. And third, this is a, this is a painting um, which also has Jahangir in it, in it but Jahangir is, um, is embracing Shah Abbas of Iran. <clears throat> and in the rhetoric that stands behind this painting, the two are represented as brother kings. So now we have a, a, a type of fictive kinship that's actually working between kings. And, and uh, the, the rhetoric of kinship is very much there, but it's not about genealogy. It ends up being about um, the coverage of space. Because Jahangir is represented much bigger and kind of dominating um, over the other king, there is a way in which he, he is the bigger brother and, and Shah Abbas of Iran is actually the, the, the smaller brother and so on and so forth. So there is a hierarchy happening, but there's a different arrangement of space and time that is being done here uh, with this, as compared to the other two. So um, next, please. So between the three, then, we, we can start to see the complexity of how genealogy plays very different roles based upon what type of evidence we are looking at. Um, and so my main purpose in giving you the examples is simply to, to suggest that there are ways of um, kind of interpreting out 
away from a kind of a very standard reading um, of these things by paying attention to these, these varieties that are present. Um, now, one of the key things, next please, um, is what is missing from these genealogies are actually the women, right? I mean, the, it's as if these, uh, these men just keep generating themselves um, and that there are no women involved. So when we start writing the women into it, the genealogy looks actually really quite different. So this is just a chart of all the, the, the mothers, um, and uh, some of whom are Rajput and uh, women. And if we only focus on dynasty, um, as represented in the original materials and, and, and see that as the frame, we're actually kind of buying into the exclusion um, of, of the women. We have in the sources actually a lot of material about, about women, uh, about these women who are represented here as well as other women as well. So just sensitivity to the problem of rhetoric of dynasty can help us to um, do much better in terms of incorporating um, female presence um, as, as, as it is uh, available in, in the sources. Now the question of the women uh, becomes especially interesting in the case um, of the Mughals. Next please. Um, um, it, because uh, Mughal genealogy actually is tied to a woman in a very, very specific and powerful way. Um, so the um, Mughals uh, are, can, and they are Timuris, so they go to Tamerlane, and, and then in the, in the self-rhetoric of the Mughal dynasty, ultimately the dynasty goes back to a woman uh, who is impregnated with light. So this is a text that we see, that I, that I put here, uh, which is on the, um, on the grave, uh, on, the, um, the, on the cenotaph of Timur himself, buried in Samarkand in uh, what is now Uzbekistan, in which it is based specifically that the man who was buried here, he has no father. He, ha he was actually born of this woman named Alankwa, uh, who is a figure in Mongol um, uh, Mongol mythology, so she has a prior history to, and uh, who, who, is, who is impregnated with light. And it, what is the text on Timur's tomb actually says that this source of light that impregnated her was a descendant of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, and by that token, that light actually is a representation of Muhammad who comes to imbue this woman, and then the whole dynasty is produced um, through um, um, through, through this combination of these two things. So one of the interesting things is that the, the woman is, uh, is there, but is made into a kind of vessel. So the general problem uh, or the general kind of valuation that we have in other so, uh, places as well. There is no representation of Alankua that I know of um, in the pre-modern sources, but in the 19th century, and this is how Alankua is represented in, as a woman with completely covered with, uh, with a burqa. <clears throat> And which is interesting because it, it actually exemplifies the issue of presence but um, absence, all, uh, both of them together. Now, one of the, the major issues that occurs, next please, um, is that the text already on at Timur's tomb says that some descendants of, of Timur will actually reflect this light and they may understand who they are through this reference. In, when we look at Mughal genealogies coming later, what we find is that there are different kinds of notions. So some kings will say that the light is already present through all the whole uh, dynasty, except it becomes especially uh, potent in, in certain rulers. Uh, right? So there is a way in which occluding, and there are all kinds of back and forth of hiddenness and appearances of this light that are going on um, in the dynasty in, in various ways. Um, so here too, my uh, point in bringing this up is just to, just to show how, um, at the at the kind of at the granular level, this becomes um, quite complicated and also varied when we start looking at how what exactly is is being understood as being transmitted when uh, transmission happens ac across generations. Okay, so I'm not uh, next, please. I'm not going, going to go into this, but just to, to give you an, um, a slight, um, I've been working on uh, Persian materials produced in South Asia between 1600 and 1900. There are 200 different works on the past that are available. Some of them are invested in the gene genealogical thinking, some are not, etc. 
So this is just a, a, a kind of typology that I developed about thinking about the immense diversity of, of ways in which time is thematized in these materials within which the kind of examples I'm showing you fit in. So behind that stands a, a whole complex um, of contested notions about time and space that are being um, uh, evaluated and evocated through genealogical thinking. So. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to the second case, which is uh, uh, the Sufi uh, Silsila, or the Sufi chain of authority. Um, now, th these are very important, much like uh, genealogies and royal genealogies in the sense that um, they, are, uh, they, they represent the anchoring of authority in the past. Uh, next, please. Um, and these are just two... Um, representations of what a chain of authority looks like, one Nakshmandi and one uh, Qadri's uh, Silsila in South Asia. Um, um, they are especially important in the marketplace of ideas, and people want to say, because all these Sufis are actually contesting with each other, so they produce these genealogies as ways of comp competing um, with each other. And these are always constructed in hindsight. It's someone who is in the present actually portraying the past as being genealogically connect connected um, in this way. Next, please. Next. Um, so, so within them, them uh, we again have this valorized space-time that is present in, in, in these type of uh, materials. So what I'm going to do is to uh, kind of decode or try to give you some specifics of one of these genealogies, the poster that is represented here. Next, please. So this is a modern poster produced in Pakistan um, of the Qadri uh, Sufi chain of authority. Um, next, please. So just in terms of how, this is a very complex um, uh, graphic representation. Um, so on the very top is God and Muhammad. So there is a way in which um, the, the time is rooted in this essence, which is um, the, the prophet and, and God together. The middle part is the genealogy. Uh, but it's a very complex way of representing it um, because there are actually three different genealogies that are working in, 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 the, in producing this. Next, please. Um, so there are uh, four things that are highlighted on the, uh, on the poster on the, on the left side, on the part, um, where, you can, where we can see um, they're, 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 it's actually giving two genealogies one from the mother's side and one from the father's side. They both go back to the prophet, to Hassan, one to Hassan and one to Hussein. Um, and those are, they're melding together in the, in the graphic form um, as well. And then at the bottom, there is, um, there is a genealogical chain given um, uh, that is genealogical in the kinship sense and a second one which is based upon the transmission of religious authority. So what we find in this kind of a representation is this very complex intertwining and kind of braiding together of multiple types of genealogies into producing the authoritative figure who comes at the very end, who is the current incumbent, who is being celebrated um, in this genealogy. And there's a lot of text that is present all over the, on the poster that is kind of producing this um, inter, um, intermixing um, in various ways. Now, what you see on the right here, um, in, in, which is in the greenish, yellowish thing, um, th so this is the person who is the incumbent of this chain of authority. And here, uh, after him, are shown his sons and grandsons. Right? So it's, it's the present and then also looking to the future that is, that is built into it. And all of this connected together all the way to the prophet and, and God. Um, so we have this present, past, future um, all together. Um, and also, next please. There, are, there is very specific mention of Baghdad as the place where the chain starts and then into Kuwait and Karachi cities in Pakistan. Right? So space is actually brought together as well and intertwined with, with various uh, versions of genealogy, both kinship-wise and also with respect to transmission of religious authority to produce this very complex um, picture of authority. Now, the key thing is that just as this silsila has this, all the others have very similar ones as well, and they're all in contestation. So part of the reason this is so complicated and, and sophisticated is because they're working in a field in which they're competing against other people who are doing very similar things. 
Next, please. Now, the, one of the key things about the Silsila that I was, the chain that I was representing is this man, who is a currently a politician in Pakistan, um, who represents himself as being connected to this, and his claim is that he has shaken hands with people going back only four generations to the Prophet himself. This is based upon a Hadith report that uh, on a, 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 a tradition of the Prophet where he says, anyone who shakes hands with me up to five links is guaranteed paradise. And this man's claim is that there are three people between him and a jinn who lived for 1,200 years. Um, and so he's directly connected to the Prophet. And he holds these um, uh, gatherings in which he shakes hands with, with people, guaranteeing them paradise. So I'm just giving this example of how this actually becomes embodied and how the genealogy uh, becomes so important for actually political action, social action, and action, and so on. Um, okay. So, so I hope between the two of them, between the dynasty and the Silsila, we can sort of see how looking into the logics of genealogy can help us to um, uh, unravel some of these things. Next, please. I'm not going to go into this, but there are actually alternatives uh, to uh, genealogical thinking that are present in representations of time as well. So this is just a mapping of a chronicle written in 1500 in Gujarat, um, in India, um, in which and, and the, um, genealogy is completely broken, and this is an analytic year-by-year -year account, but every year that this man narrates, he puts all people in a single category together. So it's kings, viziers, and so on and so forth. So in a way, it, it, um, it brings together people based upon their functions in society away from kinship. Uh, so this is a very de deliberate way of going against the production of, of chronology through, through genealogy. Next, please. Another one, a massive work, which is printed in eight volumes, which is a history of Persian literature um, of people, uh, and people who are regarded as poets. Um, and what this man says is that you have to imagine time as the plain of Arafat, the place where Hajj happens in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula. And he says you have to imagine uh, time as a, as a place on which uh, there are um, 28 houses. These are the letters of the Arabic alphabet. Each house has three rooms, the ancients, the middle ones, and the present ones. Um, and then uh, and what he says, I'm going to narrate to you the history of Persian literature through an alphabetized version of all these uh, 3,500 poets that, that he talks about. And here, too, kinship completely disappears. It's an alphabetized time, time that is produced into a completely different format. Again, there are lots of details to this, but I don't have time to. I just wanted to show this as the alternatives are present. Next, please. So, um, with that, some, um, uh, some final thoughts. Um, so, I hope um, one of the things that is clear, what, what my interest is, um, is to think about genealogy as a rhetoric and narrative pattern rather than social reality. And making that distinction can help us um, make more of, of these types of materials. Um, and I think this, this kind, of, uh, uh, kind of breaking apart of things has, um, has um, special uh, significance for uh, narrating issues such as gender, class, alterity, and so on and so forth, so that we are not actually buying in to the, the, the rhetorical and narrative claims um, of our sources. Um, now, the other part that I want to emphasize is um, that the instability and contestation is what produces genealogies. Genealogies are not representation of reality. Actually, reality has to be um, extracted from them on the basis of thinking of them as rhetoric and instable contestation. And if we do that, then uh, we start to see, we, we start to put these societies in motion, even though the, 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 the works that we are reading um, are representing or are claiming to be representing um, stable realities. So in a way, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a kind of an attempt at a symptomatic reading of these things in which genealogy is actually becomes an important tool to, to, be, to think of these things as symptomatically rather than as direct representation. Um, and ultimately, um, my hope with this kind of work and the larger project of which, of which this is a part is to generate new ways of 
thinking about the sources and to, to, to create alternative uh, narratives, um, to be very closely tied to the material we have and pay very specific and careful attention to the material, but to produce histories and representations of the past that try to move away from the from the, what has become standardized in terms of thinking about these societies. Um, and genealogy and kinship then is a, is a very important window in terms of trying to do that when we think of um, genealogy as, as valorized space-time. And I will stop with that. But if you look back at, at um, Professor Bashir's earlier uh, writing, which really, again, it deals with um, messianism and notions of, if you think in Shiism, also is ultimately dealing with, uh, with uh, notions of legitimacy across time and even across not even physical time. Um, you see that he was destined to head in this particular direction, perhaps, and, and we're all better for it. Um, and I think one of the, again, there's so much that's, in a sense, packed into uh, this presentation that I just want to essentially highlight a couple of uh, background issues which I think are um, uh, revolutionary and groundbreaking in what you actually do. Um, and one of them is precisely this notion of actually um, uh, reimagining and, and um, the, not just reimagining, but actually um, uh, looking very differently at the construction of Islamic history. For every single person in this room who's ever taken a class um, on Islamic history, um, there's this absolutely bizarre kind of narrative in which Islamic history, let's leave the pre-Islamic past out of this just to simplify the story, um, but Islamic history begins uh, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula um, in the 6th century of the Common Era, uh, and um, with the birth of a person named Muhammad, and uh, he dies in the seventh century, and he has successors, and they spread out of the Arabian Peninsula, and they go to Egypt, and they go to essentially to Syria, and then they spread more, and they spread across North Africa and to Spain, and they spread eastward across Asia, um, and this kind of and that's the and essentially it's that the linear construction of history that we're all taught, and as you go further in time, it becomes visibly messy. Um, but uh, there's always this attempt to reimpose this order of, of narrative of, um, uh, of essentially which, uh, so for example, it becomes visibly messy with, well, how do you accommodate Southeast Asia into this narrative? How do you uh, reconcile, even in the most simplistic way, how do you reconcile kind of spreads that go across landmass um, and the very early um, participation of Muslim populations in ocean trade, uh, which creates an entirely different sort of network of expansion. And what it actually does, the short answer is, is that historically it marginalizes um, a lot of cultures, a lot of peoples, a lot of places in its forced attempt to maintain the centrality of that original narrative. Um, so again, when, why do we assume that, uh, why do we uh, identify Arabs with Islam more than we identify South Asians with Islam when there are three times as many South Asian Muslims as there are um, South Asian Muslims. Again, generically, why do we not take Southeast Asia seriously uh, as a center of Islamic history? Um, again, I'm not just bringing this up as a question, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm mentioning these things because these sorts of questions are ones that, in fact, Professor Bashir has raised, and I think they are major contributions um, to, uh, to scholarship on the Islamic world. Um, what I'm going to just do, like, in very briefly, a couple, I just want to highlight a few things in, in, um, in his presentation, in your presentation, um, and then kind of open it up to questions um, after that. I'm actually struck by uh, an emotional response I have, is that I'm unsettled. I'm unsettled when someone tells me it's not like this. And part of me is, you know, you, ha you had that, uh, the chart from Stanley Lane Poole's Muhammadan Dynasties, this book from 1894, uh, um, uh, which is, this, it's, this, it's a magnificent chart. I mean, I wish we could sit and study it for a, an hour together. Uh, it's a magnificent chart uh, for any number of different reasons. 
But two things that really struck me about it are that one is that it is very geometric. Uh, all the dynasties have right angles. Um, uh, and the second thing is that they fill the entire page. Um, and I think that's intentional and it's remarkable and that's where the trouble lies, I think, in some sense. I am comforted by the complete page because it makes sense of history, right? And this is where the trouble comes in. Um, looking at dynastic history or any other kind of complete historical narrative um, is in some sense remarkably comfort comforting. And I think at a very basic level because it makes sense to us at some level. Um, and to destabilize that leaves us with um, this, this, this problem of, you know, what do we do now? And I don't mean to say that in a trivial way because we can, you know, we can just, one way in academia, that's what we do. In fact, that's in fact in the humanities and the social sciences, uh, particularly in the humanities for the last 20 years or 30 years. All we really do is take apart existing narratives. Um, uh, and then the question is, well, what do we replace it with? Uh, that's one question. And the other question I have with that in the making sense of it and like why it helps us, uh, why are we attached? I think that's a very important question, at least for me, which is why are we collectively, I will not take any blame for this, uh, we are collectively fascinated by um, dynastic drama. Um, again, I don't purport to know the names of all of them, but I do know that there are several that talk about the British empires and European stuff that are extremely popular. Um, there are ones that actually have come out of Turkey, which like half the planet watches. Uh, the most recent one um, uh, is, was produced by Netflix in Turkish. Um, so there are all these, why is it that um, there's this enormous collective investment in this. Um, and I think I just wanted, in, 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 I mean, I have lots and lots of other questions and lots of comments, but um, one of the things that I'd actually, I mean, I really, I appreciate your point about bringing, saying that, you know, the, the, the uh, focusing on the women actually would change the narrative completely. And that's very true if we're talking about um, dynasty in a particular sense. Um, and with that, just to complicate it, I wonder if, if we look at some other, I don't want to use the word genre, uh, but if we look at a different medium um, of history. So for example, if we are in the historical narratives and some big chronology of a dynasty, the women are present. Um, is it that we choose not to look at the women? Or is it that we choose to buy the chapter title, as it were. Um, so that, our, uh, and put differently, if we were to ourselves read the histories, would we come to uh, an interpretation more akin to, uh, maybe not as brilliant as, but more akin to Professor Bashir's reading, and not the reading that's in the table of contents, as it were? Um, because I'm, I was, again, when one actually looks at visual material, I think, and again, it's very well selected, but there's a particular way in the vis visual material excludes so much more than, the, than certain other, and that's when I say media, like a long history says more than an image in that actual history. So these are questions actually that, that came up for me. Um, uh, and I, maybe I'll stop at that point and let you respond. And sure, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, and, and I use the visuals um, precisely just to make this kind of a blunt point yes, um, in, yeah, in a way. Yeah. And, and precisely, I think in the visuals, um, it, we can't get to the women because they're not there. Yeah, yeah. But in the texts, we actually do have it. Yeah, yeah. In a way, my point is actually precisely what you're saying is that when we read a dynastic history, um, it it allows us to imagine the world from the perspective of the author who is invested into di in the dynasty, who are the, the male figures. That is also that's an act of imagination that we have we undertake. We kind of we don't buy into it, but we treat it as as, as truth. So in a way, um, the invitation could be um, 
to actually deliberately go and look at the women and try to Im imagine the world from, from their viewpoints, right? Mm -hmm. so it's the same source, but it, it's, it's a, um, or, or from other types of subalterns or alterity, mm -hmm. etc. So I think the sources actually have a lot more if we can get away from the, the, mm -hmm. the framing investments and so on. Yeah, that's fascinating. Why do we like to be, have, why are we collectively so invested in, in the simple frame? Or in a, no, it's not always simple. I've been watching one of the Turkish ones, and, and it's not simple at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, so in a way, the, for me, the question is um, not being able to answer that question as to why we are invested in it, but what I'm interested in is treating every investment um, of, uh, treating the past as multiple and differing investments of presence, right? So the, so the question would be, uh, so Ertuğrul or all the, the Turkish ones that are, that are happening now, um, they're telling us so much about what's happening in the world today with respect to Turkey or mm -hmm. other places as well. So in a way, the same instinct in which we can understand this from mm -hmm. our own vantage point, do the same to every other representation of the past that we can find in order to then come up with um, uh, kind of deeper understanding in which that past was, uh, was actually produced. So in a way, I'm taking for granted that we are invested in these types of narratives. Um, and it, and, but when we create our own narratives, um, even if we actually replicate that, to do that self-consciously, rather than uh, presuming that there is, uh, there is a stable history that, that, is, that is out there. Uh, so the looking for things that are haunting the text and the materials in, in kind of subtle ways rather than simply taking for granted what's on the... What's on the so then in a sense what you just, I think, I mean, if I understand you correctly, you're actually in this moment making a distinction between actually the, the production of historical narrative and the consumption of historical narrative. Like we... Obviously, we create a narrative in the process right. of our making a meaning out of the one we're reading or whatever. But, right, right. but we are kind of consumers. So it's like the, guy, the, the person who actually produces Shah Jahan or Jahangir's history does it differently than we do when we read it. Right. Yeah. And, and part of what, what is interesting for me is, in, uh, is to actually take the former producers of history, whether it's in painting or much more so in narrative, as people like us who did the same kind of things that we... So we have no escape from, from historical thinking for, mm -hmm. about the past. But in, in order to, to understand them sympathetically and to allow them to deconstruct us in some ways um, because of sometimes of radically different notions of what the past was. So it's, it's, it's almost like trying to create this circular dialogue about the past um, by treating these authors, or imagining them as speaking to us um, in, in, a, in a certain way. Okay. Um, it, it's to me, part of the issue here, part of the interest is um, to how to, to get to truly post-Orientalist ways of dealing with these types of materials. Um, to not treat them as simply as objects that we have the power to interpret while also the, knowing the fact that we have to do it, to how to create these um, dialogues through very self-conscious production of the social whole within which these things were produced, um, and then allowing them then to reflect back on us um, in, a, in a certain way. Does, does that make any sense? It does make sense, but I mean, again, and then last question that I'm asking is sort of like to then, um, but... I'm, again, struck by the use of the word orientalist, and I understand in which context you actually are using it here. But there's another thing, right? It's like there's also the notion which, um, which probably has nothing necessarily to do with kind of orientalist intellectual enterprises. It's that repeating the past without questioning it is uh, a way of reinforcing truth, right? And this is religiously very, very important, right? right. right? So it's another project that actually exists which you're also asking to, to, to be revised. Right, yeah. right, right. While being taken seriously as a social project. A project, right. yeah. yeah.
should I let on that note actually let's open it up to questions comments right there oh it's beautiful thing oh. <laughs> hello <laughs> nice to see you oh thank you so much uh, professor for that great talk um, I have a question about um, uh, tribes, because actually, you know, tribal organizations as well um, really subscribe to the notion of, you know, a genealogy, a past. Um, but as you go into the modern period, like in the, you know, uh, early modern into the modern, um, it also assumes an ethnic identity, eventually a racial identity. And I'm wondering if that also happens in the literature that you see about genealogy in an earlier period. So, um, do uh, distinctions of race and ethnicity and, um, I mean, obviously they are about, you know, enforcing a superior identity, um, and that's why people preserve them or fabricate them, uh, and we recognize it as such. But I, I think that, I mean, my sense is that in the modern period, it does assume a much more um, sort of ethnic, racial uh, overtone, undertone, whatever you want to say. Um, and I'm wondering if that happens in the earlier period as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting um, question. Uh, and so uh, to give you an example, one of the ways in which Mongol history is thought about is, that is, the, is the story of Alankwa is represented as uh, Mongol ethnogenesis, right? So one can see why this may be the case uh, if we work from modern patterns. Right. But when we look at um, Mongol and Timurid and Mughal representation of this, it's not really ethnogenesis, it's dynastic genesis is all they care about. Uh, right? So in a way, there is a comparability uh, in, in terms of production of collective identity through reference to the past and through this notion of connectivity of, of uh, kin that is very similar to what modern tribal uh, kind of configurations do. But I think it becomes interesting and important to, uh, re to, to see the, the comparison, but, but then to socially contextualize it within the, the, the different world in, in which it is happening. So sometimes some of these, um, especially with respect to tribes, they can be pushed back as somehow natural genealogies, um, which, which I'm somewhat reluctant to. Now, one of the interesting things is that certainly they are produced uh, for for political effect, for um, et cetera. But sometimes they're also interestingly produced in order to accommodate um, um, the, the ones who have lost. So the most interesting case for, that I've come across with this is the production of Afghan histories in the Mughal period. So the first time that the Afghan becomes uh, 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 an ethnic marker whose history has to be told in a certain way happens actually in the Mughal court when the Afghans are no longer the, the ruler. So, so in that way, the production of the ethnic past um, is actually a Mughal imperial project, which means to incorporate them um, into the Mughal system. In, in, I'm oversimplifying this. But so I think the, the, the question remains, but in, in a way being sensitive to the production as it's happening in different contexts then allows us to see variation and the kind of play on, on, on those categories. And, in, and then in the modern, it becomes different, as, 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 as you're saying. Paul. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, very, oh, thank you, Shasad. That was very thought-provoking, and I'm uh, grateful for this uh, conversation as well. Um, your comments just now um, made me think about the role of uh, genealogical texts in um, an earlier period that I'm more familiar with, in the early Islamic period, where it strikes me that um, as you described it, they also serve multiple functions, uh, making political claims for the present, but also I think they, come, they, are, um, they memorialize um, the past. And um, they will often inscribe or rec uh, record a group, a dynasty, um, um, a tribe, or an ethnic identity that is facing social death at a particular time that is passing from history. And so there's a kind of um, f energy behind the drive to record them before they're lost. And I wonder if this um, is 
also a motive behind some of the genealogical thinking in the sort of wilder and woollier uh, period that you're, you're studying? That yes. is commemoration. Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but in a way, the, 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 I completely agree. And, 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 and this is precisely the type of um, variation with respect to what is held under the notion of genealogy that, that I'm interested in thinking of different types of valorizations and, and kind of operationalizations that, that are happening. And, and, and within that too, then memorialization itself can have varied histories as to why cert certain things are being memorialized at certain points and so on and so forth. So it's precisely that kind of opening up this Pandora's box is what, uh, I, what is most interesting for me in looking at. Thank you for your, your wonderful presentation. I would like to ask something that builds off the earlier um, question regarding the geological dimensions of, of dynastic uh, communities or, or of organizations, especially patrilineal societies that are creating these kinds of, of, of narratives about themselves which both tell stories about them but also help to build connections between people. And I wonder if you have used any, have looked at, at genetic research that is directed at trying to unpack some of those sorts of questions and testing ideas about gene genealogical relationships and where those, where those actually may be able to be reconstructed and where they may in some ways fade because in fact where kinship lies, where the connections lie, are much more in the social political realm and how that might manifest itself or ramify up and down, if you will, in social organizations at different, different communities across time and, and the areas of, uh, of the world where you're, you're studying these phenomena. Thank you. I, I, have, I haven't got, gone there except to note that I'm aware that that kind of technical capacity is available now. So uh, interesting ways in which people are, are trying to do, to do that kind of research. For me, the, that, one of the things about that is, is what is valuable about it is the fact that at, at this moment in time, we are so invested in, in this question to be able to do this type of research. And the, and the great popularity of programs on American television, for example, the one that is called, Do You Know Who You Really Are? Right? So, I mean, just that title of that program, which is about genealogy, tells us about what, the, what being is in terms of with respect to the past. Mm -hmm. So, so I, 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 I note that I'm a little, um, it's a little uneasy when it is, um, when that kind of scientific projection is presumed to overwrite the narrative production in the sense that um, because it, it naturalizes genealogy a little too much for my purpose. And I think that, so I want to say that the, the, the narrative production actually uh, and its internal logics that are, that are buried as I'm arguing, uh, they have uh, social functions um, irrespective of what um, may be able to be said using uh, genetic research. So as a component, it, it, I think it works together um, in an interesting way. But I'm a little wary of, uh, of scientism. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I want to follow up on Professor Elias's first, what he called his first question to you. Um, what I appreciated especially about the presentation was, to some extent, how universal the examples are. Um, so just from my own work, uh, the silsila is parallel to the rabbinic shalshela uh, to Kabbalah, it's the same root, um, and it's a kind of chain of transmission, which uh, what we can do as scholars is precisely point out how it is mutable, how it is ever-changing, how is it is the product of deep contest depending on region and so on. And we can, in fact, trace these, um, not with ease, but with some work. Um, and it's uh, kind of what we're trying to do, kind of get, get behind the, the chronologies rather than to just reproduce them. Um, I'm thinking also of Anthony Grafton's Cartographies of Time, where he's kind of showing how the production of timelines and ways of thinking shape uh, our understanding of the past. My question, following up on Professor Elias's question, is I find this to be very edifying uh, and interesting, and I then have a very hard time returning and trying to write a historical account. Um, once we basically realize that all of our categories are arbitrary, um, and that we could problematize them, somewhat left in a conundrum. And so the question really is, are we in a perpetual loop of some people being silly enough to write historical accounts and then others of us coming along and telling them why they're being silly? 
Um, or is there some way kind of out of this endless loop? So, so I mean, the, the, my reaction to that actually is, so is, is a lot of what I'm trying to do is, especially in, in thinking that what we do um, is actually very similar to what we can see in the past, et cetera, um, is to, um, to invite more historical production. Right? So the only thing that, that um, I'm suggesting is that uh, a greater self-awareness of the categories that, that we are actually using, that, that it allows us to do um, other types of ways of thinking about about time, right? So it's, it's, it's the most of the work, and, and it's, it's, it really is not specific to Islamic materials at all, so I'm completely um, uh, agreed. And actually, part of my argument is that what is called Islamic history is actually inseparable from Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu history, uh, et cetera, and, and there are lots of examples of that. Um, is, um, it's an invitation to creativity with respect to the creation and implementation of categories with respect to producing the past, in a way, right? So it's, it's meant to open. And part of what I find really interesting about thinking about these uh, pre-modern examples is that we have all these radically different versions of the past available, right? Which have been excluded out from the modern narrations because they don't fit the dynastic or the silsila models. To bring them back in and allowing them to, to um, kind of come to inhabit the, what we are producing as well and so on. So hope that, that is very much the hope and not uh, deconstruction. I, and for me, the book that I'm finishing is really is not about deconstruction, the deconstruction argument I've made before. It's actually providing examples for how to construct alternatives um, in, in various ways. The two questions in the second room. Hi, thank you so much. I hope this isn't a repeat question. It has a separate entry point, which is the uh, image. One of, and I think in the third genealogy you showed, there was the poet coming in and offering his book. And so um, this kind of sparks my question about the figure of the artist or of the historian who writes these accounts. I mean, there's so much labor going into these that wasn't um, from members of these dynasties themselves, right? And I'm thinking about that in relation to the figure of like the 19th century historian um, who obviously seems to feel such a distance between himself and his subjects. Um, whereas I think some of the court historians, or at least like the part, like, is kind of imagining themselves within the construction of these genealogies and really identifying with the lineages. And so I'm just wondering if, if you have more thoughts about that and, you know, where is this breaking point and does this signal a rupture or is there more continuity there than, we're, than meets the eye? Thank you. So, so what I find in the materials that I look at actually a great variety. So there are po in the authors and poets who are very identified with, the, with what they're narrating, but there are also other ones who are completely oppositional, who basically say, well, I'm getting paid, so therefore I'm doing it. Uh, and the most interesting ones are uh, histories and chronicles written in verse itself. And in one uh, important one, which is produced in Iran, where the poet is addressing the king who is paying him to write this and says, if I don't write, you don't exist, right? Uh, right? I mean, so they, they have a sense of power with respect to the production of, of narrative. And then, and so in the techniques that are used, there is immense complexity in which the person of the, of, of the historian actually um, can play all kinds of different roles, sometimes obvious, sometimes occluded in, in various ways, and there are even ones that, um, in which they, uh, they're deliberately like undermining the people that they're, they're writing about as well, even when they're getting paid by, by, the, uh, by the same one. So it's, it's this great variety. In a, in a way, I think you're right that in the, in the modern 19th century version, with the professionalization of history, it becomes a single model. And at least what I look in the in before that, there's much greater variety. Absolutely. Uh, oh, I just dropped my nose. Uh, so first, thank you very much for the 
uh, talk. And I, I will also want, I kind of want to ask a question coming from, from the area that I know best, which would be the Ottoman Empire. And so, uh, I mean, there were kind of a striking uh, similarities. But something that is interesting for the early modern period in the case of the Ottoman Empire is that sometimes you have simul simultaneous genealogies that people are producing at the same time. Uh, people are reading each other, and they don't seem to care that sometimes they are contradictory or that they kind of attach to different origins. They just seem to be interested in producing these uh, narratives. And I got, because sometimes it struck me and kind of that hopefully will lead to the question, is that they, they understand genealogy and kinship sometimes in a way that is not interested in historical truth in the same way that we are in the modern period, right? Sometimes kind of that exercise, that narrative and rhetoric exercise has maybe different um, powers, different capacities in constructing kinship, but sometimes maybe not even that. So kind of my question is, in the case of the Mughal, or the case of the, of the sources that you have been looking at, um, was to what extent these genealogies, rather than limiting uh, or kind of foreshad like kind of hiding uh, historical realities, actually allowed them to, to recreate or change uh, practices, including, for example, legitimacy of a son, that by erasing the mother, you actually also erase possible conflicts of how noble or how important a family the mother was, giving all sons equal capacity to claim the throne, for instance. And kind of the second one uh, will be, do we have a sense of how seriously they were taking these genealogies or the history of that? Or were there more maybe literary exercises? Or, I don't know if that makes sense at all. So, so I think that there is, my, my inclination would be that there is no single answer to that, that question, that essentially it varies, uh, and that there are certain places where we have, let's say, a possibility of reception history where we could see as to why they're implementing uh, certain type of genealogies and, and, and not. Um, the, the question, the issue that you mentioned about the contradictoriness of, of them and that they, they, they seem to be working, uh, they don't seem to actually care that much on, on as to... Um, that, that multiple ones could exist even if they are contradictory at the same time, right? So that's interesting because then it suggests, um, again, symptomatically only, that the, um, it's, it's the notion of genealogy that matters and then what the content of it um, can actually vary um, greatly um, across the board. And so I, I can see all these possibilities and the exclusion of women as, can work in, uh, for the same reasons that, as you were saying. Other times, um, women can be brought in specifically to, to try to counter that and so on. But the most interesting question for me in, in what you're raising is, so we are supposed to narrate the past using these sources that seem not to be invested in a single positive history, right? So in a way, that is suggesting that any claims that we are making are highly suspect. And so what I am trying to suggest is that we take genealogy seriously, but we actually rethink what kind of knowledge is available to us through these types of sources. And that can then allow us to write different, you know, so we are after a certain type of truth, but what's the nature of that historical truth, given the, that these are the investments that we are seeing conceptually in our sources, allows us to kind of um, rethink some of our own presumptions about what is actually available to us to write about this society. And so that's the, the, the comparative part that helps to kind of um, make a methodological or kind of attitudinal point with respect to what, what history means or can mean. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, it's extremely interesting. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm curious about this marketplace of ideas that you spoke about and the, the, or the idea that these genealogies are emerging from instability or contestation. It seems to me that part of that and part of your use of the term rhetoric is to... Is to imply that these genealogies were meant to stabilize or to persuade that there was a sort of recipient for these genealogies. And part of that to me, and that's fascinating, and I think Professor Elias maybe alluded to it in his question about the dynasties and why we're so attracted to this, is that the persuasion isn't just based on an internal logic or an imagination that fits into a framework of how time's supposed to work, but actually works emotionally by compelling and by engaging audiences in interesting ways. I mean, obviously the Qadri Silsara is visually stimulating 
in a way that was supposed to do work. But um, I'm curious if you've, if you've thought about or you're engaging in this, in this project with the emotional aspects of time, the felt aspects of time, in addition to the sort of imagined logics of time. It seems to me to be a particularly important piece of data that we're drawing out of there, especially if we're thinking about how to, what sort of knowledge we're supposed to get out of, out of these genealogies. So just wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. Thank you. No, this, that's um, exceedingly significant and, and, um, and something that I have um, tried very much to think about. Um, and that is part of um, paying attention to the affective quality of these narratives and not simply turning them into data. So the, the key point, the key um, issue that has stood out for me is the immense use of poetry in chronicles and historical narratives, right? So even when they have been translated into English and from the 19th century onwards, the poetry is just dismissed um, as that, that's just Orientals being Orientals or in the 19th century. And even in more recent translations, they, they are. So I'm actually very um, closely key to try to understand um, what does the poetry actually do. So one basic observation about that is that the, the poetry actually carries the moral and emotional message. Um, and and it, it's, um, uh, one of the ways in which is that, that, that like in a modern uh, sense, we take a verse and then we try to explain it. What happens in these texts that most of what I'm looking at is that first they will give the event and then they will give, give the verse which actually says what the point was and where the emotional register is. So paying attention to the types of ways um, in which the poetry is inserted into the text helps to see uh, some of these res registers. And one, and it becomes really interested in, interesting in cases where there are translations from one language to the other in which poetry is inserted in certain points, um, which kind of reveals or gives us a hint about what does the chronicler care about with respect to these things. And they're all kind, and poetry is, uh, they're also very self-conscious uses of poetry in, in, in case of one author who says that um, all the poetry that you will see in this narrative is my own except for four uh, verses that come in the beginning. And he says that um, if you take them all together and put them separate, it's a single poem. So it's actually two interrelated narratives that, are, that he's claiming are intertwined together and that it's a hidden history if you look at the verse alone. And, and he's constructed it such that, um, that it, it, is, it has this internal kind of other logic to it, and that they, that therein is a lot of um, affective issues and critique and things and so forth.